once you hit the self-oscillating point with the resonance, you'll get a sine wave. There it is. Isn't that beautiful? And you can tune the filter using the VCF. testing an ARP X right now. So far I've checked and calibrated the power supply so that I've got good plus minus 15 volts. It's a dual voltage unit. Um, I have been going through the test points and uh, it's, it's going pretty well so far. Noise is good. LFO square wave was good. Though the signal is dying before it gets applied where it's needed, because I haven't noticed any uh, real alpha square wave. Uh, gate's good. I have no envelopes at all, uh, neither the positive nor the negative. And uh, I'm about to test the square and the saw. So the output's at test point six and seven. And I'll also show you the output from test point two, which was the uh, LFO. Yeah, it's pretty boring, but that is a square wave, and it's uh, 20 hertz. Actually, I haven't actually calculated it to see if it's right, but I think it's right. So, now test point five and six test point six there we go oh that looks pretty nice so that's supposed to be from seven and a half volts up to fifteen and uh, I am on five volts per division so Given that I doubt my oscope is particularly calibrated exactly, I'd say that that's really good. You can tell from the divisions that it's got definitely the right peak-to-peak um, -peak value. It might be slid down a little bit away from the 15, but the peak-to-peak -peak difference is what I was looking for. So I've got a good sawtooth oscillator. Now we gotta do TP7. There's seven. And there's my square wave oscillator. And we also see it is running about the same. Um, you know, like seven to fourteen, about a seven volt difference. Let's see if that is what is expected. Yeah, there you go, five to fourteen. I'm pretty satisfied with that. Seven and a half to fourteen. Oh, that's even better than I was expecting. So it only goes up to fourteen. So so both the sawtooth output and the square wave outputs are good. Okay, so I'm just playing around with the filter now. I wanted to show something kind of interesting. So y'all know what filter sweeps sound like. Here's what they look like in really slow motion. So I'm adjusting the filter cutoff frequency. Um, it's at a very, well it's at the minimum value right now. So the filter's closed. So I'm going to open the filter slowly. I'm actually playing um, a note maybe a octave or two above a little C from the keyboard, but the filter is changing what you hear. You can see the frequency changing, right? Because that's the pitch. And now, I'm guessing that's in like perfect harmony with the note. Because here we're going to break out above it. There you go. Got those dual tones. This is with the resonance all the way up and the keyboard control voltage all the way up. No resonance. 
resonance. Resonance. Pure filter. Notice full open, I am on a square wave. Because I had changed the uh, input to the filter in the mixer section. You can also get a really dramatic effect using keyboard tracking. So let's see what happens if I switch over to a, a, a sawtooth. is the saw with the filter fully open. So you can verify the filter, you know, what it, how it shapes the different inputs. You get some pretty cool stuff going on. I'm doing some testing of the envelope circuitry on an ARP axe. Uh, it's got some problems. At first I thought that really that the envelope was not working at all. But what I found is that the attack is always set to maximum regardless of the slider. And this synth has a really long attack. So unless you're holding the note, you will you'll think that the envelopes are not working at all. So that's the first thing we're checking out. The second thing we're checking out is the fact that release doesn't release. So that is the ARP. You can hear attack if I hold it. See, that was the filter attack. You can hear how the tone's changing but very slowly. So, I've been taking some readings and I don't like how the uh, attack slider is performing. So, here's what we're doing. I put a jumper on it and we are going to take the attack slider out of the equation and you'll be able to hear the difference. So that's with attack set to minimum, simply by shorting across the slider entirely. So the circuits are responding, the envelopes are there, but I've got a bad slider for the attack. I'm going to do something similar to uh, the release. I will uh, again jumper across it. I may put a potentiometer kind of uh, effectively in parallel with the one that's there and see if I can control release that way or not and get it to actually cut off notes as desired. So there you have it. Little jumpers and potentiometer rigs to uh, do some more detailed troubleshooting of an analog synthesizer.
Envelopes, envelopes, envelopes. So I'm looking at the envelopes up in our backs. I've attached a, a lead to a test point. I've also jumpered out the attack slider because it's no good. So I'm going to have very fast attack, like as fast as it can be. So the oscilloscope is set to a very slow movement so you can actually see the shape. And there's the attack and decay. And if I let go, well, we're at sustain levels right now. Got a pretty low sustain. And then there's the release phase. And there's a pretty long, slow release. So that's good. This is what it's supposed to look like. There you go. Let's see the whole thing again. Attack, decay. I have a, obviously a long decay in there. And then there's a, the faster release cycle. It goes down faster than decay. So that's it. If I want to look at the slow, um, slow attack, well, I can do that by removing my jumper. So now I've removed the temporary jumper that I have on the attack slider, which is no good. This will cause the attack cycle to be uh, as slow as possible. So maximum attack. And we'll be able to see that right now. Alright. Okay, so I'm jumping out the attack slider once again. So I have a minimal attack phase. I've got this on auto repeat. And I adjusted the sustain down as well so that you can hear and see those pulses. So that is auto repeat. It's working fine. It's based on the uh, LFO frequency. So if I change the LFO, It's up around 20 hertz LFO. And we get down to a sub second oscillations. Okay. So once again, these circuits are working well, but we've got these envelope and slider related problems. That's what we're going to troubleshoot next. So here's the number one thing I've learned so far about the axe, at least mine. It's the sliders. Every problem I've got is the sliders. So right now, uh, I'm using sample and hold to the VCO. So what that does is it takes the output from the noise circuit, which is a random voltage. It combines it with the low frequency oscillator for speed control of the, uh, the blips. Here are the beautiful blips. Runs them through a slide potentiometer, and then you get voltage, and hence pitch jumping around. So, this pot is jumpered in in place of the bad one. It affects the range of pitch. So as I turn it down, values are compressed effectively. You can also see that on the oscilloscope. I could widen the range a bit I suppose. Let's say here. Zoom in a little. Let's see if you can see this better.
pretty narrow range. Now you can see it. The highs and lows are quite a bit different, and you can hear it too. Now I've removed the jumper with the pot on R77. This is what it was doing before. So you just get the LFO pulse, single pitch. So, you know, interesting in its own way. I could uh, maybe see a mod. <laughs> toggle switch to drop the slider out of the circuit and get that random pulsation effect. So, mod number two. There's some other features of the axe that appeared to be giving some trouble. Um, but I think a lot of it is tied up in the fact that the attack was so long that I couldn't hear other functions working. So there's a, uh, a repeat function. So there's a switch here. That's the underside, of course. And it gets the LFO pulse into it. And then it passes it through when it's in its kind of its on position, but it has two on positions. One is auto repeat. So you hear the note just playing over and over. And it's under the speed control of the low frequency oscillator. Because I've got the attack pot effectively shorted right now, you can hear those pulses nicely. Plus, it's very sensitive to where sustain is. So it almost goes away. They change sustain. So now if we change it to there's the off position. I still have my release problem, so don't worry about that. Here is the key repeat position. So when a key is pressed down, the LFO signal is passed and it causes the, the pulse of the keys. Now, the LFO signal is not going all the places it's supposed to go. So in addition to playing with that switch, which is, uses the LFO, the LFO slider is causing me trouble. So what I'm doing, similar to what I did with the uh, attack slider, is I'm jumpering it, but in this case I'm putting a potentiometer in line. I mean, I know I, I you know, could do the same with attack, but this is just to kind of show you uh, how these things work. So these two leads are across the potentiometer. This one is the output, the tap, the center position tap. Now we have pulsing, but this pulsing is based on the setting of the potentiometer. So I'm going to quickly solder that in. Okay, now we have variable control. By the way, just as an aside, some of these techniques that I'm using are the same techniques that I would use to circuit bend or do mods on a synthesizer. If you don't like the range of a potentiometer, hey, try a different one. If you want to mix in some signals that normally aren't mixed in, well, you can start to get the idea of how you could do that. So, right now, we're getting a more interesting synthesizer here. Working a little better than it has been. There you go, there's the pitch control again. Same speed. 
It's just that the jump, the pitch from low to high, varies with the amount of signal being passed. And effectively, the uh, you're increasing the amplitude, the peak-to-peak -peak voltage, um, as you change the potentiometer setting. So there you have it. Um, I'm finding a few more problems with this, and you know the sliders. The sliders are definitely a significant source of trouble on the synthesizer. I think I've got maybe four that I've identified as bad, and they're hard to test. Uh, well, it makes it hard to test the rest of the synthesizer because the sliders affect so many things. If they're not working right, you don't get a, a true understanding of what else is working or not working uh, in this particular synthesizer. But, rest assured, there are ways to work around them, um, as I'm demonstrating here with potentiometers and little jumpers, uh, so that you can get into testing the deeper, you know, baseline functionality, you know, testing that LFO, testing the envelopes, testing that everything is responding like it should, you know, so that you know at least if your integrated circuits and the other transistors involved in uh, shaping the sounds are good or not. And then these sliders, well, that's a matter of getting replacements, which is a little tricky. You can't just buy one or two, I don't think. But you can get a set of modern replacements uh, and just wholesale replace them all. Uh, or you can try to clean them. It's possible I can clean these. I'm a little skeptical about a couple of them, though, because it's It'll just give me open circuits, you know, or constant reading. So there's, you know, significant failures in these sliders.